Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. So good to see you all. Do you want to put into the chat where you're all joining us from? I recognise so many names. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Hello, Hi, to see you all. Great to see you. Oh, look, New Jersey. Hi, Sophie, wow. Lamit, and Switzerland, and Tennessee, Middlesbrough, Pennsylvania, Vancouver. Wow, Memphis, NYC. Look, how lovely. Good. <laughs> so wonderful. Well, for once, I'm back in Spain, which is really, really nice. Really nice. Just uh, <laughs> back where I belong and I am so excited that today which is the um, anniversary the first anniversary of the book being published we get to give that back to you guys so that you can ask me whatever you like because I know we do a lot of these where um, it's quite formulaic and we have um, very very similar questions but um, Joe Sedgwick who is um, an assistant and who approached me and said she'd really, really like to do something for the anniversary, has tried to come up with some questions that maybe I haven't answered before, which I'm very excited about. So maybe um, I'm just going to get Jermaine to give you a wave, who is my EA, for those of you who don't know who she is, and Kathleen Drum, who is my senior editor. Um, I know some of you will have met her or seen her around. Um, will Brown isn't on camera, but he is also here, who is my event director. But I'm going to ask Jo to introduce herself to you and um, let you know her background. So hi, everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jo Sedgwick. I am PA at De Corsi Alexander in London, and I'm very happy to be here to speak to Lucy about the book, uh, The Modern Day Assistant. I've really enjoyed the book. And um, before we start with the questions, Lucy, I just wanted to say what resonated with me about the book is that it um, doesn't discriminate against um, anybody who has a uh, disability or is from a different um, uh, background or has, you know, from a different country. And it doesn't discriminate. So it's um, very nice to... Um, ensure that it resonates with all the systems regardless so that's what I really loved about the book and so, so shall we shall we get cracking with the questions then we've got loads to get through so yes, um, absolutely okay and, so, and, and shall I just say that also that if any of you have got questions as we're going through I am really happy to take any questions this evening so feel free to put them into the chat and then um, one of my team will pick them up and will feed them back to us once we've got through the official part of the interview so Joe, hit me with it let's see where we get to okay so Lucy I've done my research as you'd be pleased to know um and in one of the recent interviews, well, about 10 months ago, you mentioned that BlackRock has got the global skills matrix over the line and that they'll be probably doing a uh, case study next year, spring of next year. Do you have a progress report on that? And do you know if they are doing that or they're on schedule for that? And will you be able to share that case study with us? Very much hope so. It's the wonderful Simone White, who many of you will be familiar with. And Simone's journey was so interesting because she started off not as a C-suite assistant at all. She was just looking after somebody in the company and she was an EA. And she'd been working for over 20 years as an EA. And just one day sat there when they'd been restructuring other departments and thought, this isn't fair. They're not doing the same for us. And so she started on this journey and she thought that she was quite happy and that actually she was doing really quite well. And, you know, and then all of this, all of a sudden, this one day just had a moment of revelation and thought this isn't fair. So the result of that was that she ended up as the top person at GAIN. She put together a um, network for all the assistants globally at BlackRock and GAIN was the result, which is the Global Assistant Internal Network. Now, um, she then organised training and did all sorts of things for them. And that was all really incredible. And the business was getting a lot out of that. But she decided that they really needed to restructure. That was the final stage. And so they were part way through their restructure when the Global Skills Matrix was um, published. And for those of you that don't know what the Global Skills Matrix is, it's a framework for career progression, um, which is for 
assistance anywhere in the world. And it was six years of research that that framework was based on. Um, and when it was finally published in 2021, it was signed off by the heads of associations from 29 countries. So it really is um, a very useful um, piece of kit which you can take to your HR departments and use as a starting point for discussions about how you should be structured within your organizations if you want promotion or if you feel that you should have an internal assistant network or indeed an internal assistant function, administrative function. So when they finally did finish um, building their structure, they ended up with three levels. And that's the great thing about the Global Skills Matrix. Although there are five levels, it is a framework. So you use it in the way that you want to for your business. So they decided that they only had two threes and fours, um, twos being reactive and task-based, threes being reactive, moving to proactive and more strategic, and fours being those who are um, entirely proactive and probably leaders in their own right. So their titles for those, which I thought was terribly interesting, were administrative business coordinator and administrative business partner and administrative business lead. So we did quite a lot of talking then to their HR and their learning and development departments because they wanted to track what that looked like within the organization and how well it worked. But that's an 18 month process. And they have done case studies with Harvard Business Review on various things before. And they very much wanted to track and see what the glitches were and what things worked really well so that in the end there will be a case study coming out of that. So we are now, I believe, just under a year into that process um, and they are gathering the materials that are needed and getting them off to Harvard Business Review and I hope very much that in um, sometime in the next six, seven months we will end up with something being published so that it's the executive from the HR department. department. We really, we really need, need to be able to see what it is um, that restructuring their assistance is able to do for them and for their organisations. And I don't think it's going to be, um, we can talk about it till we're blue in the face. And actually, I've done a whole heap of talking with businesses all over the world mm. about how to restructure their assistance or administrative functions so that they get the most out of them. And in some cases, we've been very successful with that. But I am hoping that if we manage to get to the finishing line with um, Harvard Business Review that it will open the eyes of a whole heap of senior management who haven't ever thought about their assistance that way. Excellent. Thank you, Lucy. So my next question is a year on since the launch of the book. Um, how has the modern day assistant evolved? And is there any plans to do a follow up book? We've already had um, ideas for a new title, Lucy, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, modern day assistant revisited. So there you go. <laughs> My goodness, I can see Kathleen and Jermaine looking very scared at this prospect because I have to say, I didn't really have time to write this one and I wrote the majority of it in planes and um, in hotel rooms. And in the end, in fact, I checked myself into an Airbnb um, for six days to complete it. Um, wow. And it was very, very easy to write because it just it was downloading my brain, really. And the publisher said to me, you know, you um, are writing it like you're teaching a class. And I said, well, of course, because I'm downloading my class. Um, I think if I was going to write another one, it would probably be on how to speak business. Because when I mm. talk to assistants, what I find time and again is that they really know what they want to say, but they're yeah. not so sure about how to um, put that across, I guess, in business yeah, meetings. Exactly. And they're worried that they're going to say the wrong thing and therefore they don't say anything at all. So I think it would probably be a book of terminology and how to find your voice and speak up in meetings and make yourself like, sound like part of the team instead of support sitting to one side. Well, that, but I that, think in the last yeah. year, what's been exciting is seeing the number of assistants who have written to say, you know, we loved it. It's given me a different perspective on the way that an assistant can be utilised within an organisation. And a lot of assistants, funnily enough, have bought a copy and given it to their executives with a note on it saying this is where I'd like to get to. And I love Excellent. that. Really Excellent. pleased about that. 
Yeah, I mean, th this is this is a question that you've had time and time again, but really, I'm really curious. How did you come up with the title Modern Day Assistant? And who do you, um, who is the ultimate, ultimate uh, Modern Day Assistant to you? That's a great question. Well, Modern Day Assistant is the class that I've taught for eight years. And actually, we kept coming up with different titles for it, but everybody had started calling it MDA, Modern Day Assistant. And so then that's what it's known as. So we just kept it. And when we came to write um, the book, there were loads and loads of different titles, but we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do would be to just call it the same as the course, really. Although obviously it expanded so that it was um oh gosh what is the second part of it uh i'll have to grab a copy do you know that's really terrible i know it's the monday assistant it's uh, it's, it's... But i didn't i didn't realize lucy that the course came first i thought the book came first and then you did the courses to complement the book but it was the other way, way around was it it was the other way around. So I've been training it for eight years. And really, it's, um, yes, that's where that came from. It was from the, it was the name of the course. But to me, I think there are several modern day assistants who are really out there doing their thing, one of whom is Simone White, who I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. Anne Hyatt at the height of her um, EA role when she was at Google before she became a chief of staff, very sure. definitely operating in the way um, that we're talking about. So many, actually. And it's really wonderful to see Laura Belgrado, who is a trainer in her own right now, some of you will know. I love her. You know, when she interviewed for her last job, she sat there and um, said to them, well, interviewed them as to whether they were the right company for her to come and work for and said, I will only come if you'll allow me to do my training. You know, yeah. she is. So, yeah, I'm, des I'm definitely interested in the course, um, especially the one that you offering in London. So what can people expect on that course? What, what will we what will our key takeaways be from that course? Oh, gosh. I mean, it, it, the thing that I love about the course is that usually assistants walk in looking slightly nervous and not sure what to expect. And the body language is very much quite often they've been sent on it, you know, and their executive has said, I think you should do this. And they turn up, up not knowing what to expect at all. And really, it's a transformation in mindset more than anything else, I think. Um and what's different about the Monday Assistant is that I am a CEO, so I'm training it from a CEO's point of view as to what I absolutely need from an assistant. And really put to one side, I think, the myths that you have in your own head that say I shouldn't be doing that and that isn't really my place and all those things that are hangovers from the way that the role used to be. I hate that. To me, and Jermaine and, uh, will bear testimony to this. I mean, she came to London very, very smart. She said to me very shortly after she started, I want to come to your course because A, I want to see what you're teaching, but B, I also want to see what your energy levels are like so that if I'm trying to work out what you're doing around that, I know how tired you're going to be and whatever. That's exactly sure. what I'm talking about. The modern day assistant is not somebody who is support, who is sitting there doing bits and pieces that the executive doesn't want to do. The modern day assistant is a administrative business partner who is doing all the things that the executive doesn't need to be doing for themselves. Because simple economics says if you're both able to do something, it should be the assistant that's doing it because the executive should be doing the things that only they are able to do. Yeah. So for me, um, it's two days of communication and of uh, project management and of looking at problem solving and business strategy and productivity. It's it's just um, working in partnership more than anything else, overarching all of that. Um, but also learning from each other too. And you can see the transformation because they walk in like that and they walk out like that. And That's they write brilliant. to me a lot afterwards. They write to me a lot afterwards to say how much they got out of it. So fabulous. That's really good. That really is good. Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot here, Lucy. Who inspires you? 
in the profession? Um, and we can come back to it if you want, but I'm just curious to say to see who you would think that who would inspire you. Well, he inspires me in different ways. The assistants that really grab hold of their situation and go and drive change are the ones that really, really inspire me. I mean, there are so many trainers who are just wonderful. And all the people that I work with, I work with because they make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end at one point or another. You know, all the, yeah. actually, we launched a speaker bureau um, probably about five years ago. And we did that because I was so fed up of talking to assistants who were saying, I I hired somebody to come and do training and they were rubbish. Um, <laughs> so everybody who is on my speaker bureau is somebody that I have seen speak personally who has made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. And I thought, oh, wow, I love that at some point or another. But for me, where I get very excited is the people that you probably won't have heard of at all, like Lisa Larson at 3M or um, like uh, Rebecca at Baringa, or like um, Sue McCormsky at, uh, I can see Jermaine is nodding, and I've ju I'm just back <laughs> after a summer holiday, so, uh, but over in Australia, she's doing amazing work at her company. You know, there are so many of them. I probably talk to 15 companies a week, all of whom are doing amazing things and are stirring the pot and are driving things forward and being incredibly brave and taking that step to go and have those very difficult conversations, which results in thousands yeah. of assistants over the course of a year having their trajectory changed because they get the vision as to what we're trying to do. And, you know, I'm so this has been 10 years for me of campaigning for assistants to be recognised for the work they do and for organisations to use them properly. And really, it's time we're talking about it so much and I'm fed up of talking about it. I want to get it done now, exactly, you know, exactly. and I know there's a whole heap of work being done in the background. Um, from all sorts of leaders. It, I can't do it on my own. There are half a billion assistants worldwide. So yeah. it really is about handing it back to the assistants now and giving you all the tools to go and do that rather than just writing thought leadership pieces. I think it's very much okay. Yeah. Here are ways in which you can go and do it. Don't read it and go, that's nice. Go and have that conversation and be one of those brave people who is so yeah. inspiring, who goes and makes the change. Definitely, definitely. Um, and then I'm just going to flip that question on the, its side and say what other, and I think I've heard you talk about this before, but what are the biggest mistakes assistants are making time and time again? They worry that they're getting above themselves. Yeah, undervalu they undervalue themselves, don't they? We all undervalue it, it, ourselves, I think. Yes, and I think that very much, it is um, the case that it's because of the history and because it's seen as women's work still, it's 98% female. And yeah. actually, when I sit down with your executives and I explain what the result will be if they use you properly, you know, I had one man, I had one man who really stood out for me last year, who when I went to go and speak at his organisation, he, all the assistants and all the managers said, if you get him, we're over the finishing line because he's the one who will drive it. But he doesn't think he needs it. So we'll see if he comes. And 10 minutes before, because I do a lot of presenting to boards now, a message came saying I'm too busy. And anyway, I don't really think I need this meeting. And one of the senior assistants marched down the corridor and almost grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and bought him. Well, at the end of the hour, he was almost in tears. And he said, you know, if what you have just told me is correct, I will get to see my wife and child for the first time in about 18 months. Wow. So I think understanding that you are powerful, assistants don't think that they are powerful, mm -hmm. but you are incredibly powerful. Just think you have the power to make an exceptional executive mediocre, and you have the power to make a mediocre executive powerful. And if that isn't power, I don't know what is. So stop hiding 
and thinking that you're getting above yourself and understand that you are a subject matter expert in what it is that you do. And that really, particularly around process and procedure, nobody else thinks like that. So if you're driving that agenda forwards, you're always going to be successful. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. I think we all need a bit more confidence within yes. tackling those conversations. But, but the only here, way to get confident is to do it. Some of the people that are the most powerful now in this administrative profession started off not saying boo to a goose. I'm sorry for the Americans who are going, what did she just say? Because <laughs> <laughs> I know that's one of those that goes straight over their heads. But, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a case that a lot of assistants who started off being very quiet and very gentle either got cross or just got, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I have got to do it because we need it, you know. So I think you don't have to be C-suite in order to do it. You don't have to be the lead assistant to drive it. Look at Simone White, just from a, an EA to somebody really low down the food chain. But actually, they've offered her promotion since then. And she's very much of the opinion that she doesn't want to do that because she wants space to do her work within the company. Wow. Wow. Mm. Gosh, my, I've got my next question. It's quite a big topic. So please bear with me. So I've looked on LinkedIn and I'm very surprised that there is like 20, I think I counted 24 job titles, um, which is derived from the assistant, you know. And um, are we doing ourselves a disservice by creating our own job titles, which is what I think quite a lot of people are doing, or they're getting all the executive or the HR are, are giving us the job titles, but there, there's a massive amount out there. And, it, and I'm just curious to know whether you think that we should have one job title by, say, 2025, and that should be executive assistant, or are these... Are these um, job titles to be um, looked at, which is, I've got here, executive business partner, strategic operational lead, chief administrative officer or manager of ex executive support. So I'm just wondering, because I'm in the process at the moment, I'm PA, and I'm in the process of um, changing my job, uh, job, job description to executive assistant, and I'm going down that route, and my my executive is supporting me in that but I think maybe if that's if those four job titles I've just explained if that's where we're heading perhaps I need to jump even further um because I'll I'll go to job uh, executive assistant and then we'll be go needing to go to partner and things like that so are we am I right in going to executive assistant or should we be looking bigger at the bigger picture or does this um, what you were talking about at the start of the call about the skills matrix is that going to feed into everything and should I just take a breath and just let it all naturally happen? I think we are in a state of acute change Joe. and mm. I think we have found 162 job titles for this marketplace. And that is not including it. any in translation, and that is not including any of the nonsense titles where they join project manager with assistant or whatever because they don't know how else to get you a pay rise. Um, but part of the you're right about the global skills matrix. Part of the reason global skills matrix is one, two, three, four, and five is because. We didn't want anybody not to see their job title in there and think it didn't apply to them. We wanted you to be able to map what it is you got to the global skills matrix. Now, the problem is we get very tied up with titles with the administrative profession because there are not um, there is not clear career progression and there are not clear competencies and skills. The yeah. minute that you are. Um, just like everybody else in your organization, you have a title, you understand where that fits into your career progression, and you understand what level that makes you, and you have the core competencies, and you have the skills and the kind of tasks you can expect at each level, then you understand exactly what you need to do in order to be promoted. So 
the titles become less important and saying, well, I'm a level three assistant or I'm a level four assistant. If everybody understands what that is, that suddenly becomes far more important because think about it. In the UK, you can be a PA who sits on reception or you can be a PA looking after the CEO. And in America, a PA is someone who looks after a celebrity or someone of high net worth. Uh, administrative yeah. assistant is the more likely name over there. But what I am seeing is that where secretary went, assistant seems to be starting to go the same way, particularly in the UK and Australia and in America. Secretary is still the word, by the way, in a lot of countries, in Asia, in, Af in Africa, in the Netherlands, funnily enough. Um, so secretary isn't dead and buried yet either. But I think what oh. is important within organisations is that they are understanding what you're capable of. There is a clear career progression so you know how to get from A to B to C and that you understand what is expected of you in order to do that, what the structure is, so that you are not tying yourself up in knots with, well, today I'd quite like to be this job title. It's yeah. not It's not helpful. I think we're, we're really helping the um, recruitment agencies to understand that when they're advertising, they should be saying this is a role for a level three assistant or this is a role for a level four assistant so that everybody understands clearly what it is that they're applying for, as opposed to the smoke and mirrors that seems to be there, which just stops you being paid properly or promoted accordingly. Mm. So what can we do to help ourselves? Is it is it is it having the chat with our executive? I think so. And I think it doesn't have to be a big chat either. I no. think it could just be a we saw a woman talking on a webinar about this career framework, which I've gone and had a look at. And I think it's really interesting. Which level do you think I am based on this? You know, and open yeah. the door that way. There's actually a letter which is on the Global Skills Matrix website, which you can take to HR, which was written by one of the top 10 HR professionals in the world, and oh, which wow. explains exactly what it is. Sarah Richson is just phenomenal, and she started out as an EA. There's also um, a, an executive summary of the Global Skills Matrix, which is only five pages long, because we know your executives <laughs> have the attention span of a gnat, and unless they can see it immediately, they're not going to be particularly interested. But I think, you know, saying, where do you think I am on this? The reaction I get more than anything else from the executives when we show them is, we're not using our assistants like this. It had never yeah. occurred to me we could use our assistance like this. And if everybody else is, I think we're missing a trick. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And in your opinion, should admin, and this is changing the subject slightly, but in your opinion, do you think admin, uh, admin teams and uh, business support teams should be separate or do you think they should be combined? It's a very interesting question because, Joe, we've argued for the last 10 years within the World Administrators Alliance about what we should be calling ourselves. Because whenever we say we need a job family, yeah. people say, well, admin is derogatory. I don't think so. You know, I think if we are administrators, an administrator is not a derogatory term. If yeah. you were to say that somebody was an engineer, they could be somebody who comes and fixes your washing machine, or they could be somebody who puts a man on the moon and everything in between. But that job family is engineers and everybody knows what it is. If we are administrators, it's exactly what we do, isn't it? We administrate business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So our executives are out there driving things forward and coming up with new revenue streams and making sure that new ideas are put into place and that the business is working. We handle the administration that goes into the back end of that, and that is process and procedure on the whole. So calling us administrators, I don't think is derogatory. And yeah. business support to me is part of that. It is part of that administration yeah. piece. And I think having support is fine. Having support is fine. You know, we're executive support. The magazine is executive support. But again, calling us assistants suggests we're assisting. Calling us support suggests we are helping. Supporting. Yeah. Yeah. 
And actually, part of the reason I love what BlackRock have done with their administrative business coordinator, administrative business partner, administrative business lead, is that it makes it a role on its own. And why is that important? Well, I'll give you a really good example. It needs to be a standalone role. There's an amazing woman who I've worked with for really quite a long time now, and she was heading up um, all the assistants at an organization where there were nearly 300 assistants, but she was also looking after the CEO, and nobody could say more nice things about her. Everybody said how fabulous she was, what a great job she was doing, how she transformed the business with her work. The CEO left, and they employed a new one who bought his own EA with him, and they let her go overnight. Wow. How often does that happen? Because we're attached to our executives. Think yeah. about all that talent that just walked out of the door. Whereas if you are an administrative business lead or an administrative business partner, maybe not quite so much, do you think? Correct. Yes, I totally agree. Yes. Yeah. It, it but the up. way you, you've just explained it, though, it was it makes sense now, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Good. Definitely. OK, so here's a question that I uh, that is my question. You have influenced assistants all over the world. Which country, in your opinion, is leading this profession? And I am putting you on the spot here, but I've got my own thoughts because of um, like technical. Um, I would have thought like uh, Japan and China would be leading on the technical, you know, the technical development of things. But I'm just curious to know who who's at the forefront. Who should we be mirroring? Who should we be admiring and looking at? You know, who's got it right? For example, I really think different countries for different things. You know, I think it's very interesting that even from right at the beginning, the Nordic countries, when I went to present and were saying assistants aren't looked on properly, were saying to me, that doesn't apply to us. They respect us. They know who we are and they use us properly. Yeah. The Americans, I think, are doing a pretty excellent job at stepping into the strategic business partner piece at the high levels. But there's still an enormous amount of assistants who want to be reactive and the businesses are still set in that mindset that says that's what they do and they belong to the executives and tell them what to do. But the ones who are flying are really flying, really flying. When it comes to structure and to having credentialing, and the things that we really need to make this a profession, one of the top countries is New Zealand. And in fact, wow. it's interesting because New Zealand quite often is where um, changes in the way that professions operate starts because they're a small country. So their Bureau of Labor Statistics starts things and then sees how it goes. And then if it works, it it all rolls out. But, you know, the UK is pretty super. The UK is doing some really amazing work. Um, yes, I mean, I can't think of any countries really that are behind. I think, you know, of course, if you go to Asia or you go to Africa, certain parts of it, um, certain parts of the Middle East, you've got to get over the attitude towards women before you start getting over the attitude towards assistance. But I have trained in some really um, interesting countries, particularly in Africa and Asia, where the women on my course started out being really quite giggly and nervous and by the end of it we're presenting project plans so you know I think um, I'm a great believer in one profession one voice which is you know when I first started this there were pockets of amazing work going on all over the world and some real drivers for change going on but in the individual countries so one profession one voice is about pulling everybody together yes. so that they are working together so that 
all across the world we are speaking with one voice and explaining what we're capable of doing and there are so many amazing resources now the world administrators alliance is putting out all sorts of stuff the various associations in each of the countries are doing great work for their members but for those of you that don't know what your associations are within your country on our website there is a page that lists them all so you can go and you can have a look see if there are any networks that are close to you but also of course we have all sorts of free resources as well and we're always happy to put you in touch with people who are in your country who we think you should be talking to if you think that it would be useful excellent and i'm going to stop there and i'm going to just see um how jermaine is going with the chat to see if there's i see um quite a few questions are popping up so i don't want to hog the limelight so to speak so if jermaine's around she could just yeah. let us okay great yeah, I'm here. Um, great questions, Joe. so far. Some really interesting questions. Actually, I think you might have even asked some that I don't think I've heard Lucy answer before. So that's always really cool. Yeah, yeah it's really, really think. good. Um, yeah, there's a few questions here on the chat. So we have one from Sophie Zamet. Um, and she asks, Lucy, how do you think you could build good alchemy with your boss? Good alchemy with my boss, good chemistry with your boss, yeah. I assume. OK, um, so first of all, I will say to you, Sophie, that I would quite like to get rid of the word boss just because um, it has connotations from slavery times. And so there's a bit of a campaign going on full stop to get rid of that word. But building relationship with your executive, I think it's all about communication. And to me, um, it's about having your 10 me minute meeting with them every day. You and your executive should have a 10 minute meeting every day. And you can get through an enormous amount in 10 minutes, but it's the thing that builds the trust. So 10 minutes every day to go through what's on the calendar and make sure you both understand that, to go through any emails that maybe you haven't had a chance to um, get to what that actually means, to look at whether anybody, in my case, wants to book me to go and travel anywhere to go and train, to look at things that are going on in your department. Can you see you can get through quite a lot if it's just 10 minutes a day and you're, you're getting through it really, really fast. Um, but then I think it's if you're doing things, it's making sure that you are doing them properly, because that's what builds the trust. So, for example, supposing Jermaine was to come to me and was to say to me, I think we should be implementing this new procedure because I think it will really help us to do things in a slightly different way. And I say, OK, so what are you expecting the end result to be? And she'll tell me and I'll say, well, go on then, go try it. Let's see where we get to. But then we agree how often she's going to communicate with me about that. And over a period of time, as it's working, if she now comes to me and she says, now I'd like to do this, I'm like, well, yeah, it's good because you did did a really good job on the last thing so let's see what she can do with the new one so if you're wanting to get to a point where the two of you are singing off the same hymn sheet I think the important thing is clarity on what is trying to be achieved it's about that ongoing communication and it's about building trust yeah, definitely I hope that answered it enough for you there um Sophie um Another question here, Lucy, from, I'm not sure if it's Barbara, it must be Barbara England. Um, what procedure would you suggest if your book were to be used internally for training assistance within the organisation? Uh, yes, well, I think um, several companies have set up book clubs and they have had their assistants go away and read the book. And then when they have come back, um later on they have got everybody together to discuss what they think about various chapters or various things that are suggested whatever if in fact you buy a hundred copies of the book or more um i'm happy to come and do something for you but uh you'd have to talk to Jermaine about that. She's going pale even think about it. She knows what the rest <laughs> of my year is looking like. But yes, yes. But um, I think it, I would take it chapter by chapter, maybe, and go through and use discussion points in it. That's, that's the procedure I would use if you want to use the book. Get everybody to read it. There are questions in the yeah. back of the book, by the way, that you can use to talk amongst your assistants. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Mm. Yes, if you want to within within a book club. 
that leads really nicely onto the next question, actually, because saying going back chapter by chapter, um, Megan Byrne says, hi, Joe and Lucy, and happy birthday to the modern day assistant. She says, Thank chapter you. five will be one that I reread over and over to remind myself about dealing with difficult personality types, something I've been working on throughout the year. She says, my question is, how do we identify the fine line between an exec with a different personality type to us versus a toxic person? Oh, that's an exceptional question, Megan. Thank you. And you're always great at coming up with these very complicated questions. Well, not complicated, <laughs> but difficult to think through. Do you know what? I think the difference is, you know, it, that we. I know you're talking about the red, the yellow, the green and the blue, different personality types. And dependent on who you are, different personality types will be held to you, dependent on what personality you are. So, for example, a red who is very um, autocratic and it's very much be quick, be fast, be done, get out. I'm not interested in talking to you about things. It's going to be my way or the highway. Some of you will think that that is absolutely a terrible, terrible executive, whereas some of you might quite like that because that's also the way that you like to work. And Kathleen will tell you, my <laughs> editor who's been appearing. I there, knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Yes, I knew you. I knew you know I was going to say that. That my idea of hell is a blue because blues do detail, 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 and of course assistants do detail. And Kathleen is my blue. But because we understand each other now, we don't lock horns like we used to. And I know Kathleen won't mind me saying this story, but in the book there's a story about me spending maybe three months putting together a brand new website and sending out a link saying, can everybody check it and just tell me what you think? And I think it was precisely three seconds before she came back and said, there's a comma missing on the third line. And I was just like, <laughs> you know, but of course, and we need that as a business. So I but think it's I'm about a former EA, so I'm pretty sure every EA on this page would be like, "Yep, I'd have noticed that too." Yes, so exactly. I was like, "If you're if we're presenting to EAs, we've got to be, you know, we've got to be your people." Totally, and I'm red or yellow, so I'm always, you know, kind of this is going to be amazing, and we're going to do this, or I'm kind of what's going on? Can we just get to the point? Having said all of that, and I do think in most cases, if you understand the personalities, it can be really helpful. Sometimes you just have an executive who is a pig. And if that is the case, you are not a tree, as my friend Martin would say, and you can uproot yourself and leave. Sometimes executives mistake assistance as being their property. And they're still with their head in the 1950s <laughs> in that they can talk to them kind of a la nine to five. But I think, you know, if that's the case and they really won't change, that's your moment to sign off and say, well, thank you very much. But I am going to go and find somebody that is going to support my career, is going to treat me like somebody with talent, because you are not just a resource. You are talent. And I think this is the mistake a lot of businesses make, you know, mm -hmm. you are subject matter experts in your own field. And you are talented. And, how, and Lucy, how do you figure out what colour you are? There's there's a quiz. I think we talked on LinkedIn about this. There's a there's many surveys, isn't there, to try and tease out what what colour you are. So to Absolutely. start, absolutely. And and yeah. it's either insights or it's a uh, disc or it's. I mean, they all end up to being pretty much the pretty much the same, and they'll tell you exactly what you are. And really, you can tell for yourself anyway. I know that I am a yellow or a red. It's so clear, so clear. And Kathleen, it's so clear is a is a blue. And Jermaine, you're probably a green and a yellow. You know, I can. And it's so funny these days. I can sit in a training course and I can almost say within the first five minutes, oh, that person's going to be that because you can tell by the way that they're talking about things. And it's really yeah. wonderful. But when you understand your colour and you understand what your executive's colour is, it makes for a far more interesting relationship, I think. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I think Kathleen has been monitoring. So I've been monitoring the questions in chat and I think Kathleen has been monitoring the questions in the actual Q&A uh, section here. So I'm going to hand over to Kathleen and I think she's got some questions there as well. 
Yep, I've got a question here from Sarah Huxtable. I left an organisation with 10 EAs where we had regular meetings and shared our learnings. If you're the only assistant in the organisation, how do you how do you continue to gain experience? I would be joining an external network or I would be looking at this kind of thing. Um, there are so many free webinars and free trainings and so on that are available online where you can come together with your tribe and you can still share information. I know that when we do executive support live in whichever country we happen to be doing it in that year, we very often get assistants that say, oh, thank goodness, I found my tribe. Because even if you are working in an organization, you're very often siloed, aren't you? You work right across the business, so you don't necessarily share best practice and Jermaine is our only EA with our company but I oh, know I you know that. yes and so Jermaine um, is forever going and taking it upon herself to go and find training quite apart from the stuff that we do so that she can keep up to date with exactly what it is that's going on but I think sometimes also you know I'll get companies who'll come and say will you come and train our assistants internally and I will always say yes of course I will but have you also thought that maybe if they were to mix with assistants outside they get slightly different perspectives too so it's whether you think it's a positive or a negative and I think sometimes training with other assistants from outside your business can be a huge positive. Thank you. That was great. Um, I have another question from Giovanna who says, will the course be online? Is my course online? Yes, yeah. it is. It is, it is. We're about to announce some new dates. So yes, I next would love week to see we you should, there, Yeah, next week we should be announcing all of the dates for 2025. So um Keep an eye on our website. I'll, if you don't know our website address, I'll pop it in the chat in a second. Um, but yeah, all of the new dates will be released next week. Yes, and very excitingly, we've just confirmed Johannesburg. So we'll be back in South Africa next year. And we oh. are just about to release dates for London as well, which will be in November next year. So yes, those are the two for next year. And of course, we're in Seattle in, in November this year. November this year. Yeah, fabulous. Um, oh, sorry. I have another question from Charmaine, and she says, any advice on how to manage up with a manager who likes things his way and is not so open to change? I think it's about making it about them, not about you. I think as assistants, we very often go and say, I'm your assistant and really we should be doing this. And I think it would be a good idea if we looked at this because that would be so amazing. But actually, if you are wanting to get things done, making them understand what's in it for them is very helpful. There was a guy that I recently interviewed in Seattle who was it was it was an interview that was all about partnership and he was really quite grumpy um and he was saying um he said it drives me mad he said and i've been listening to you all all day talking about expanding the role and i get it but i organize i employ assistants and i want them to do that and no sooner have they arrived than they want to do that and i don't want them to do that what i want them to do is that because that's what i've employed them to do so i did kind of say well i get that but surely if they do that immaculately and you can see that they're doing that phenomenally well and they got it, you would then be happy for them to also do that. And if they do that perfectly, maybe you'll let them do that and that and that. So they expand over a period of time. And that's about building trust. And he said, yes, absolutely. But I said, you know, if they're doing that, then that can only benefit you and the organization because they have skills that maybe you don't know. So if they're doing the job you've employed them to do and they're doing it immaculately and then they have other things that they can take on, then of course you're going to be happy. Absolutely, he said. But I would be talking in terms of, if I do this, it's going to give you back this amount of time. If I do this, here is what drops to the bottom line in terms of your salary. Because don't forget, every hour that you save them is an hour of their salary that drops directly to the bottom line. So that is what your contribution is to the bottom line as an assistant. And also, if you're saving them an hour here and an hour there, it's what they then go and do in that hour as well, which generates revenue. So it's making that business case as opposed to saying, you really should have access to your emails. I'm your assistant. Give me access to your emails. No, 
You know, the average executive spends 58 percent of their time on emails. That's 58 percent of their salary that they're spending on doing emails. If I help you, I can get that down to 12 percent and give you 46 percent of your time back. Shall we try it? That's how you have that conversation. And just uh, interestingly, Lucy, this has just come up for me that I introduced on the email system, I introduced like folders on the side that said for info, for action and for urgent. And then I every every well, periodically throughout the day, I drag these emails into whichever category they are. And my boss, uh, my, my executive has has really commended me because it saves him a lot of time. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's probably the way to go rather than putting it into subjects. You can file into subjects afterwards. We have today, this week, Jermaine has dealt with to be deleted and for your information. And today is anything that I have to respond to today. And that's great because it means that when I am training, mm. if I get back to my hotel room, I know I just got to go through the stuff in today. And as long as I've done that, I'm not letting anybody down and I'm dealing with things on a, in a timely fashion. If it's in this week, that's a bit of a misnomer because it isn't this week. It's anything that I don't have to answer today. And Jermaine will move them up into today on a daily basis. But if I'm being particularly virtuous, I can sit on a plane and I can answer lots of emails. And of course, what then happens is I get off the other end and there are hundreds more that have arrived. But at least, <laughs> you know, so most of the time I'm just doing today. For your information is things she thinks I should read. Um, but I don't need to answer. Jermaine has yeah. dealt with, I don't actually need those, but I'm a control freak, as are most of your executives. So I quite like to go in and go, well, what is she actually doing today? What has she answered? Is there anything interesting from anybody that I should know about? And um, to be deleted are things that literally just delete, 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 delete. Great for the endorphins. Oh, and done. There's a done file too. So as I'm doing things, as she's doing things, whatever, they'll go into the done file so that we know they're cleared down. But it's just, it's amazing because I've gone from having maybe 300, 400 emails a day to maybe having 30 that I have to deal with. So think about how much time that saves me. It's amazing. That's, and yeah. Kathleen has done a wonderful um, two-page article which explains exactly how that all works, which is for free. So I'm sure that we can get that out to everybody who's on the call if you are interested oh, in taking a look. Brilliant. Yeah, that, and it's available sorry. on the magazine website. Um, if you go on the homepage, there's a tab that's called free resources and there's a whole heap of eBooks and all sorts of things on there for free. Uh, and the mail system is one of those. So anybody can go and look at those at any time and download whatever you want. Bad. Thank you. And just I just wanted to add as well from the book, Lucy, uh, you know, colour coding the diary for your executive, you know, and putting in lunches and putting in keep freeze and the travel time. I think it's all helpful. Um, certainly my executive finds this really great, you know, the plan, the planning before a meeting um, and then follow up after meetings, you know, I keep put keep freezing and, and specifically a block keep free for that specific task. And this is helping, uh, this is helping no end, you know? Yes, it's great. And, you know, for me, having time before and after meetings, so the meeting before the meeting, if you like, so that I have got preparation time, because yeah. it shouldn't be in a meeting at all unless you're going to use it to discuss and to decide and to delegate. If it's anything other than that, if you're not going to discuss, decide and delegate, it's an email. It's a waste of time. Wow. And I don't think people should be sitting in meetings, reading things as they're in meetings. They should be up to speed with what's going to happen when they get there because if you think about the collective salary of the number of people who are in the meeting for an hour that's massive absolutely yeah. massive don't do it if you're sitting there and you have had a piece of reading to do you've got the reading done now you're going to um, decide what you're going to do based on that piece of reading and now you're going to delegate who's going to do it fabulous that's a meeting but for me, I want time for the reading material. I want to then have the meeting. And then afterwards, I want the opportunity to put stuff into our CRM system that is notes, but also who has been delegated to do what and what that looks like. 
But much. just putting simple things in, like you said, that for years you didn't have a lunch break. Do you know what I mean? And so having time for actual lunch is increases productivity, doesn't it? So it's a no-brainer, but people often overlook, assistants often overlook that sort of simple thing, which can make all the difference. You know what, Joe? I, I said this so many times, but I often feel like one of those wind up penguins. You know, the toys that you put on the top of the desk and then it just, they point me in yeah. the right direction and they say go. But it is, yeah. I mean, you know, Jermaine organises my whole life so that I don't have to think about it. So having lunch in my calendar, having um, this is prep time for this presentation or whatever. I really don't have to think about it. I just follow what's in my calendar and the things get done that I need to. And think about how much less stressful that makes my life when I'm trying to do the amount of work that I'm trying to do. I simply wouldn't be able to run my company if I wasn't organised that in that amount of minute detail because there are only 10 of us doing all the work that we're doing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, um, I, I interrupted you. Um, sorry, you no, you're fine. <laughs> uh, I have another question from Megan Byrne. In your experience from talking with assistants, is burnout caused from the pressures we put on ourselves or from the executive or the business? I think it depends on you is the answer. And it's about being honest with yourself. You, you, Some of you know that I burnt out in 2010. And if I hadn't burnt out, I would never have started the magazine. But that was a con combination of all sorts of things. Um, it's not just about working hard. From my point of view, between us, my husband and I have seven kids. I was on a train at seven o'clock in the morning. I was rarely home before 10 o'clock at night. We were at year end. Um, and I had a member of staff who was being absolutely vile and nobody would do anything about it. So I work probably harder now than I worked when I was in that environment, but I'm far less likely to burn out because it's my company and it can work the way that I want it to work. So I think you have to be honest with yourself. It isn't necessarily the workload, it's the psychological impact. Excellent answer. Um, I hope that helps, Megan. And my last question before I hand back to Jermaine is from Sandra. And she says, how can I get my leadership team to share their DISC reports with me? Oh, how interesting. Now, why don't you just blame me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably very useful because, you know, I always say that your job is to be a gatekeeper of time, not a gatekeeper of people. And we confuse the two things. And so for me, there are all sorts of things that if you know them are going to be hugely useful for getting your executive from A to B in the quickest possible time. One of them is understanding their disc report so that you understand that if you're presenting them with information and they're a red, you want to get to the point in three seconds flat because they're bored by bullet point three. And it's be quick, be fast, be done, get out. You don't want to waffle because you're going to drive them crazy. If they're yellow, you've got an amazing idea. It's going to be fantastic. Let me explain to you how that's going to work. If they're green, take it right down. I just have got a great idea and I want to explain it to you. But don't worry, we can try it first. Excuse me. And if they are blue, lead with data. So you're going to get the information into them far faster if you understand how you're going to approach it. Mm -hmm. But equally, there's a bit in the book that's about learning styles that says, are they visual or auditory or kinesthetic? And if you understand whether they learn by seeing or learn by doing or learn by listening, you understand whether you've got to put a graph in front of them or do mind mapping if they are visual or whether you're going to put them into a meeting to brainstorm with other people if they're auditory, or whether you're going to get somebody from accounts to sit down and talk them through the figures if they're kinesthetic. And really, they'll take on the information far, far faster. And it might just be that it's 20 minutes a day because you understand that stuff. But over a year, think about how much that adds up to. And if that's that amount of time of their salary, that's the value you're bringing. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jermaine, back to you. Yeah, sure. So, 
Sandra's like a TV com- reporter. And now back to yeah. <laughs> Sandra's commented here. Sandra's commented here. Sandra Nanny, and she's commented, and she's like, "Yes, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tell them I've got expert advice now." <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. And Kelly as says, um, Kelly Radine says, "We have got nine children between us." She says, thank goodness we are now empty nesters. So it allows her to think better. Nine children. Wow, I thought it was seven. But you know, I always thought when we got to have adult children, it would be easier. But big kids, big problems. Little kids, little problems. You know, and yes, it is great being an empty nester because I can sit and do things like I've been recording all the introductions for ES Tech today. But we've now got my parents with me who are absolutely lovely. And that's (laughs) the thing. (laughs) another thing um there is another one one more question here i don't know if this is the last one i'll double check in a second but it's sophie zamit again says how do you deal with micromanagement and how could you say to your executive please stop micromanaging me micromanagement goes when there's trust and i think maybe sometimes they are just blue they're not micromanagers at all and if you understand that it takes the personal feeling that you're being not trusted out of it so my husband is blue and he does trust me implicitly but you know it's a really good example I was going away a few months back well a couple of years now I think ago and the night before he came saying schedule for this trip and I said well yes it's on the kitchen um, board and um, if you need to you can talk to Jermaine about it and he said yeah I'd quite like to go through it with you I'm going to get my book and I was just like no 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 because you know what it's like the night before you go away you're running around like a headless chicken trying to get everything in order and I know if he gets the book it's an hour and a half so he gets the book and he sits there he's like okay so which is the cab company that's picking you up in the morning and which airline are you flying and do you have a flight number and what time do you get to the other end and who's the client and do you have the cab number the other end and what's the hotel you're staying in and have you got contact details for them and what are you talking about and oh my gosh I swear that was like city one and it was a three-week tour in a different city almost every day so it was about an hour and a half by the time we were done Does he trust me? Implicitly. But he just needs the detail to feel comfortable. And very often with your executive, they will ask you all about that detail just because it makes them feel comfortable. As they get to trust you more, they might not need to ask you so much. But they might still. If I have a meeting with Kathleen, she will ask me a million questions. It's like an hour and a half. And I know that before we sit down to have the conversation because she doesn't feel comfortable unless she has the information. But equally, you know, blues are usually not so emotional. So I know there was a girl who said to me, oh, I'm going to have to leave. My executive's horrible. I said, oh, really? What happened? And she said, well, I broke my arm. And when I called up to tell him, he said, when are you back? Well, you know, I said, well, he's blue, clearly, because, you know, the blue person is going to be (laughs) not emotional. So you say I'm going to be off. And they say, when are you back? It's it's just the way that it is. So sometimes it's just about their personality. It isn't because they are a micromanager and they're trying to drive you crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Lucy, what yeah. advice could you give um, ex- uh, assistants that have got uh, that are juggling family as well as uh, trying to um, establish a career? You know, think back to when your children were younger. How did you manage it? You know, how did you um juggle the two and can you have both is there a a trade-off or can you have both to be really honest and i'm going to say that um i really didn't do it very well and if i was going to do it again i would have spent more time with my children so for those of you that have got small children or even slightly bigger children if i was going to do it again I would do it very differently. But then my generation was very much um, the generation where they were saying, if you're going to be on a level with the men, you're going to have to work double as hard. And I was a single parent at the beginning, and then I remarried. So I had three children on my own um, and then remarried. So it was always my responsibility. Um, And I don't think I did it very well. I think if I had my time again, I would have done it very differently. My daughter very often says you were never there and she's probably right. 
you know, seven o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at home in the evening doesn't work terribly well. Having said that, when I did burn out, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from the doctor was that he said, when you're going home in the evening, you have to find something that when you walk past it, that is the end of your day and you stop. So I found a tree outside of my office, which when I walked past it, that in my head was the end of my day and I stopped. And I still do that. When I'm, I live now in um, Javier in Spain and just out here is a lovely mountain and some palm trees and things. But when I'm walking along the seafront, there is a bar on the seafront called La Siesta. And when I walk past La Siesta, that is the end of my work day. And unless I've got something really, really specific that I have to do, that for me is cut off point. It's great. It's I think good for pan- balance. Yeah, exactly. And I think the pandemic has helped quite considerably. Uh, for example, I'm, I've got mobility issues and I think the pandemic has helped me no end because it's put everybody on the level, level playing field, you know, by, with working from home. And so everybody's working from home. Well, everybody's was working from home and now there's so many virtual assistants out there and so that's helped me no end you know and I think that helps the um the pe- the assistants that have got the families you know that can have that flexibility now you know we didn't we were very in a very structured world weren't we we didn't have any flexibility uh, at all but I think having the flexibility does in, uh, increase our productivity so you know I think that it's important a great trade for off. you isn't it Joe? that's particularly important for you because you yeah. have a condition that means you have to walk, work from home pretty much yeah well I think it I mean I could I don't have to work from home and I think I've removed the barriers that that once hindered me because you know gone are the days when um the uh, making the tea was the most important part of the assistant's job and I would struggle carrying the drinks I mean the 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 drink getting to the executive would be half full by the time I got there do you know what I mean but I think that um <laughs> that actually um has uh, by being a remote worker that has removed all those little silly little petty you know barriers that that did hinder me you know so I feel so yes. much more myself and comfortable in this role now. And I'm thriving, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's definitely. allowed me it's allowed me to do other parts of um things that I would never um normally have ever thought I would possibly do like this event today and being a trustee for the Shine Charity, which I attended earlier today. So, yeah, but my boss is very supportive of me. Boss executive is very supportive of me. Yes. Yes. Really wonderful. And this is the thing, isn't it? I think the world is wide open. And can I just say, I think you've done an absolutely marvellous job this evening. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, (laughs) Jermaine and uh, Kathleen and I are very used to doing this, but I think it's a wonderful example of pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and really building yeah. your capabilities and your career by yeah. pushing yourself forward so I was absolutely delighted when you came forward to say yes I would love to do it so Joe, really thank you very much for this oh, evening thank I think you it's very been much, great but I don't think I should progress um and pursue a tv career just yet I think I, I I'll be happily tomorrow go back to my my assistant role <laughs> yes Indeed. but thank you very much absolute pleasure Well, listen, everybody, thank you so much for coming and celebrate our first birthday with me. It's been really wonderful to see you all. Could I give a little um, request, which is that if you haven't yet left a review on Amazon, would you possibly go and do that for me? Because we're at 60 reviews, which is lovely. But if we get to 100, it becomes evergreen content, which means that they will keep serving it to people. And having written it, I really want as many people to read it as possible and not for reasons that are monetary reasons, because part of the reason for writing it was because I wanted to get the global skills matrix into as many hands as possible of people that haven't seen that yet. And also lots of people said to me, oh, your course, so many people can't afford to do it. And it would be a great way to get that into the hands of people who can't afford it. So please, please go to Amazon and do that for me. I would really be hugely grateful. But I think it only remains for me to say, first, 
firstly, Jermaine and Kathleen, thank you very much for coming along this evening and for um, saying hello to everybody and for doing the questions so beautifully. But Joe, really, this has been an absolute joy and I have loved it. And thank you so much for suggesting it. And um, we will draw the book um, tomorrow and put that yes. on social media and let Perfect. you all know who has won the signed copy of the book. But also, Lucy, can I say from on behalf of all the assistants online today, uh, thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. You know, you've given us your time for free and it's been valuable. I've been making notes for myself as you've been speaking. It's absolutely been wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And go and have a lovely evening or a wonderful rest of the day, dependent where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us and celebrating with us. Okay. Good evening. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye.